happy lunchtime, everyone. It's uh, noon on Thursday, March 18th. Uh, my name is John Nelson, and I am uh, with the communications team here at Vassar Brothers Medical Center, and I'm very honored uh, today to um, present to you this, uh, this webinar or conversation or whatever you want to call it about COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we're telling you the real story. Um, we're going to have a conversation with some of your uh, doctors, with some of your neighbors, with some of your community members um, to just talk about, you know, vaccines, uh, about hesitancy, about barriers, and uh, to hopefully answer some questions and, and you know, to try to uh, communicate with uh, all of you about the importance of this, uh, of all of this for our community. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brenda Ayers. Uh, she's going to lead today's discussion and uh, thank you all so much for joining today. Thanks, John. Really appreciate this and uh, really appreciate everybody on the panel and uh, for all the people who are joining us live now. Uh, my name is Dr. Brenda Ayers and I am a physician here at Vassar Brothers Medical Center, been part of New Vance Health for uh, almost 12 years now. And I am absolutely positively ecstatic about, about this panel discussion today and so so very thankful for the, the panelists that we have joining us. As John mentioned, people from within the hospital, um, clinicians, non-clinicians, as well as people who are representing um, the community as community advocates. Um, this is a little bit different than the other panels that we've done on vaccines and, and COVID. And uh, this, this is focused on vaccine hesitancy and readiness. Um, and you know, it, for me, it represents uh, the intersection of so much work that has been going on um, at Vassar um, within New Vance, uh, as well as bringing in the work that's been going on in the community. So we have a nice intersection of work around health equity uh, that we've been doing through our health equity, diversity, and inclusion initiative, um, as well as um, uh, the partnership with the Community Health Needs Committee um, as we've recognized that this is definitely a community health need to um, discuss these topics around hesitancy for the COVID vaccines and help to get as many people possible vaccinated. Um, so uh, we, have, can, we have put together a panel of trusted voices from within our community, um, both internal to the hospital and external to the, the city of Poughkeepsie um, and the goal today is to hopefully answer questions and concerns that people may have um, and really shift people from being hesitant, uh, hopefully um, about getting the vaccine to being ready for it uh, when, when, when it's available and when you're eligible to get it. So, you know, with that, I like to go around and, and just sort of ask people to give um, a quick blurb on who you are and um, where, where you are actually, uh, what community you're representing. And we'll start with um, Ms. Uh, Ozzie Williams here. Wow. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ozzie. I live in the city of Poughkeepsie. Uh, I've been around for at least 40 years. My first 10 years of my professional life was at Vassar Brothers Medical Center. And I've spent the last 30 years in public health. So um, some of you may know me as the WIC lady, some of you may know me as the diabetes lady, but I've always been part of the community and always willing to help. So um, I'm here and uh, I just wanna be a part of what we need to do to move people forward to get vaccinated. So uh, that's what I can say right this minute. I've been vaccinated, happy to be vaccinated, have friends from Georgia, Texas, Louisiana, where I was born and raised that have been vaccinated. And they're all posting and they have had great uh, responses to the vaccine. And uh, I, uh, as a person that has been recently retired, um, I want everybody to be vaccinated so I can start to travel. So I want to be able to visit my grandkids. I want to be able to go on those special trips that I have saved up for for so many years. So I think it's important for us all uh, join hands and get vaccinated so that we can protect ourselves, our family members, uh, people in the community, 
And what's really important for me is that we have our children return to school. So uh, I think that's, that's one of my main whys that I would encourage everybody to get vaccinated, to protect your personal health, but also to get our children back in school where they need to be. And I think what we're going to uh, hold on to that, Ozzy, we're going to come back. I think that's a really important point. Okay. Um, Stephanie Hall, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're representing. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Seth Hansen Hall. Uh, I represent uh, the city of Newburgh. I've um, been a member of Vassar Brothers Medical Center for uh, a little over 20 years now. Um, I work in the emergency department, um, which affords me the opportunity to meet um, so many wonderful members of our community. And I am very, very happy to be here to speak about uh, COVID vaccinations with everyone here. Um, it's important that um, in order to combat this pandemic that we all get vaccinated, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, I believe that this panel um, is set up in order to combat a lot of that misinformation, which is providing obstacles for people um, and vaccine hesitancy. And I'm just very grateful to be a participant here today. Thank you. Tiffany De La Cruz. Hi, everyone. My name is Tiffany De La Cruz. Um, I live in Beacon with my six-year-old daughter. And I've been with New Vance Health, Health now for about four and a half years, and I've worked at Vassar for almost two years. I work in patient experience as a patient liaison, and I also am really happy to be a part of this group and to connect with our community and talk about the importance of getting the vaccine. I myself have been vaccinated, and my parents just got vaccinated last week, so that was a huge relief for me and our family. So I'm excited to be a part of this. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Valerie Clouzette. Hi, I'm Valerie. Um, I am an infectious disease uh, doctor and I joined the Vassar community about four years ago, um, coming up on four years. Um, obviously, as an infectious disease doctor, I, I believe in vaccines. Um, it's one of the things that drove me to go into infectious diseases. Um, but I also believe in, 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 you know, good science. And so one of the things aside from, you know, for all the reasons to get vaccinated, which I'm sure everybody will speak to, one of the things that was really important for me um, and that I followed from day one was seeing how these vaccines were being developed and tested and, and being assured that this was a, a safe process and the way that they carried out all the studies um, was, was adequate and, and made us feel like they were doing the right thing um, and not just you know, rushing through just to get, get something created. And, and, and I truly believe that everything that has been done has been done exceptionally well. Um, and the fact that the results are, are great um, and they're really effective um, is sort of the icing on the cake. So. Um, so that, that makes me really, uh, really encouraged and I think should be um, reassuring to, to all of you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Livia Santiago Rosado. Hello, uh, I'm Livia Santiago. I'm the um, medical director of the emergency department here at Vassar. And uh, so I've been working here uh, as an emergency room doctor and director for the last year and a half. Um, moved up here with my family. We live in LaGrange. Um, my husband and I are both um, frontline doctors, obviously. Um, and I think from that perspective, it was really important for us to um, have access to this vaccine. There's some construction going on right around here. I don't know if you can hear it. but um, So I think um, from that perspective, that was, that was super important. So I'm just thankful to be able to talk to our community about that as well. Um, and happy to be a part of this. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Joe Ash Ward. I'm Joe Ash Ward. I'll be short here. I professionally focus on the health of the color majority community. And when it comes to our physical health, COVID-19 has had an outsized impact on our communities. And I'm interested in making sure that we can bring as many of us through this pandemic and make sure we're vaccinated and make sure we are in sound enough health to celebrate each other when this is done. Thank you. 
Dr. Hector Ojeda Martinez. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Hector. I am also an infectious disease physician. I've been with Vassar for four years now, full time for almost a year. Um, I used to work at one of the biggest hit uh, hospitals in, in Brooklyn. And so uh, COVID has a personal connection because I know a lot of people that have, a lot of doctors that got sick and one of them who unfortunately died. Um, I am gay, I have an interest in, an interest in LGBT health and uh, H HIV and STD care. Um, uh, I would have driven to Canada or to another or, or to Buffalo to get the, the vaccine. I'm vaccinated. Uh, I was anxious before. Uh, I was scared of getting COVID, and with after being vaccinated, I just feel way more comfortable with being protected against COVID. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and we have Dr. Medina Vernon. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So my name's Medina. I've been with Vassar since 2017 and officially part of the hospitalist group since December of 2019. And I personally have experienced a loss from COVID, losing my uh, older cousin to COVID in April of last year. So when the vaccine came along, I knew not only was I fortunate to be able to be one of the people to get it, but I was excited. And I'm glad to say that I'm fully vaccinated. Thank you. And, and I just wanna, I wanna highlight something that I'm sure it's been obvious to most of the people watching. This, is, this, this panel is very different from other panels that we have done around uh, the COVID uh, pandemic or even vaccines. Um, and that we have purposely made this a, um, uh, a panel to reflect the people that, that we want to reach, the communities that we want to reach. And, and the people who have been um, hit the hardest uh, by, this, uh, by this pandemic. So we're talking about, you know, our underserved populations, um, our black and brown populations in the city of Poughkeepsie and beyond. Uh, and so, you know, what, what we have uh, found, and, and I'm, I'm not surprised, and I'm sure most of the people on this panel are not surprised, is that black and brown folks have not been eager or as eager as others to, um, to jump to this vaccine even though we have been the ones that have been, been hit the hardest. So that is why, for me, this work is so important, right? And so our job today, uh, and I want to be clear on this, is our goal here is not to try to convince people to get the vaccine. What we want to do is give people um, the information that they need to make a decision that aligns with their priorities, okay, and what's important to them. And whatever decision you make, that that decision is based on facts and not fiction, on truth and not myth. And that is why um, we're calling this conversations about uh, the COVID vaccine's true story, so that you have the information, our communities have the information that they need in order to make the decisions that align with their, with their beliefs and their priorities. So with that, and I'd like to jump into um, our first question here, which is, and we started to touch on this, Ozzy touched on it a little bit, and I think most people spoke to it, um, but why is it important for people to be vaccinated? We talked about why for us it was important. Why is it important for people in our community to be vaccinated? And I'm going to start with, uh, with Tiffany De La Cruz, who I know has done so much work in the background with getting people she doesn't even know uh, signed up for a vaccine. So Tiffany, if, if you want to take that. Yeah, thank you, Brenda. Um, I personally have made about 40 appointments for people, um, some family members, friends, um, coworkers, and then complete strangers. Um, and it's interesting because one of the friends that I've made vaccines for were, she's of Mexican descent, she's a Mexican American, and um, she works in a school in Queens. And she had asked me for help getting um, appointments for her coworkers because I had success getting appointments for my family. So I just kind of put it out there on Facebook, like, does anybody need help getting appointments? I, you know, I'll try. 
Um, so I made about five appointments for some of her friends and coworkers. And then she messaged me and she's like, you know, I've been thinking about it. I think I'm ready to get an appointment for myself. I want to get vaccinated. And I was surprised that she hadn't, but she was help. She was helping to facilitate all these other appointments for uh, other members of the Latinx community. Um, mm -hmm. So I think um, having that person that you trust help talk to and facilitate um, getting an appointment was really important for her and also the people that she was working on behalf of. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Joash. I know you you have a lot of ties to um, to the community and to Kissy, um, and the fact that you're only 25 years old to be as accomplished as you are, um, you you do represent sort of this this generation that uh, uh, I don't, <laughs> and and you know, and so I would really really love to hear um, um, why from your perspective it's important for someone in your age group to get vaccinated. Right. Thank you for that question, Dr. Ayers. I, I feel 9-11 was the formative experience of, of, of my generation where there's not really one person you can talk to who doesn't know where they were in that moment or have someone who was connected to it or someone who was only two degrees of connection away from it. When we're talking about half a million Americans, we're talking about something that's really close to home. And from a community level, I don't think we understood early on that this is a virus that could come and take a life in 48 hours, in 24 hours, or in two weeks. And because it was a foreign concept to us, this, you know, the, the, the mortality rate that we were talking about, we weren't expecting our grandparents, our, 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 our cousins, our aunts, our, our best friends' parents, we weren't expecting it to hit so close to home. But one thing I think that's now equally as important as vac vaccinating the population is forecasting what comes next. So because this ultimately the mission here is to defeat this pandemic and everyone needs to know that every single step you take fits in alignment with that mission. That now as every person is vaccinated, that's someone that can't spread this virus. That's someone that can't spread it to someone who's immunocompromised and might not visibly seem immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. So being able to appreciate that the doubt we have is just where we start but that's not where we end. And being able to approach the conversation on vaccination as the same way we would approach a hip replacement or a gallbladder removal, as we deserve to know what comes next. We deserve to know the consequences or implications. And then we get to make that choice based on what's best for us. And naturally, I, I fundamentally believe we are interested in taking care of each other. So when we're able to bring young, parent professional seniors into the same conversation and divide up this mission of ending this pandemic we can do that in a way where we don't have to go back and it's not just hesitancy but readiness thank you thank you seth do you have any thoughts on that you're, you're muted i do among the traditionally dispossessed folks in our country, I think that there exists a deep sense of mistrust and just deeply rooted trauma embedded in each and one of our consciousness that has existed for centuries. And that this mistrust um, is a direct result of a lot of governmental policies that have supported uh, enslavement, generational poverty, disease, loss of land, genocide, mass incarceration, uh, involuntary medical experimentation, internment camps, reservations, and segregation, and that a lot of Black, Brown, LGBTQI, Asian folks recognize this, and there's a deep-seated mistrust um, as far as the vaccination um, efficacy. People are very hesitant. The folks that I've spoken with simply just don't trust that the government has their best interests in heart and in mind. Um, I think coupled with uh, the echo chambers of media uh, and a lot of disinformation that was spread during the onset of the pandemic from the former administration, quite frankly, and the very public um, 
debates which were which were had between um, uh, certain uh, former and present um, administrators in the government and Dr. Fauci, um, people just don't really know who to trust. Um, and I think it sort of falls on us um, as leaders within the community um, and physicians um, and pastors, um, aunts, uncles, industry leaders, deacons and deaconesses, um, to get the vaccination, um, to show how safe it is to get it, um, and basically to pave the way for others to do so. Uh, many years ago, I was hesitant to get uh, the flu vaccination. Um, it wasn't until I spoke with a physician that um, uh, I hold in high regard, um, who is from uh, Ghana, who said, you know, it's funny that you Americans don't get these vaccinations. You don't take these opportunities to protect yourselves. Meanwhile, you know, in, in my country and in countries that surround my country, people are dying at extraordinarily high rates from preventable diseases. Um, I almost felt uh, a deep sense, well, I felt ashamed, quite frankly. Um, and uh, that really sort of shifted my mindset um, as far as. Um, uh, you know, vaccine hesitancy. Um, this, of course, is no different, you know. Uh, right. So, yeah, it wasn't, yeah, no. I'm sorry. Uh, I, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. It wasn't until I saw a bunch of physicians that were lined up waiting to get the vaccination, um, who I respected, that I said, you know what, I think it's okay to do so. I think it's okay to trust the science. So what? So I hear. If I hear, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're, what you're, what you're suggesting as ways to to really overcome the the issues around trust is first, for to lead by example, right, and then to have um, a, a a trusted person that you can you can speak to uh, about your concerns and about your doubts. Um, I'd like to hear from the panel if there are any other thoughts around that. Because I think what Seth is bringing up is the is sort of the the heart of the issue here, is I don't trust the the situation, I don't trust the system, and I don't have anyone to to go to about this. So my default is going to be, I'm not going to get the vaccine, or 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 even if maybe if I'm ready, I don't have access or I don't know how to navigate because I don't have that connection to help me. So I would really love to hear, um, you know, from the panel on this, from, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Santiago, um, any thoughts that you have around that, around how we can overcome the, the issues around trust? But it's, I think it's such an interesting question because I think, you know, some, Seth, you put it so well to begin with. I think there, there's been a, a, a campaign of disinformation and so i think now we're trying to undo damage that was already done and clearly through the looking through that historical lens there's been damage done to uh, a, a lot large uh, numbers in in these communities uh over the course of history um i think sticking to the science right and sticking to what we know um, is probably one of the things that where I feel like I've been able to sometimes make inroads with people that started out hesitant. Um, but the most important thing I th it, to address is their questions, because at the end of the day, you know, standing up on a soapbox and talking about the safety of a vaccine or this, you know, that you may not really be addressing the source of the hesitancy. So getting to that source, getting to find out, you know, if, if people in the audience have relatives who perhaps may have hesitancy issues, et cetera, what is it that they are concerned about specifically when it comes to this vaccine? And trying to get people to really kind of get into the, the granular detail of their concern and then addressing that detail. Because I think sometimes we, we speak loftily about, well, you know, this is great and it's a great public health. Uh, and uh, if we all, you know, get vaccinated, we'll get, you know, this 
the sense of herd immunity and protect each other because the virus will not have as many you know, vulnerable people to infect. Um, but that still doesn't address the, the me, right? What am I afraid of? And sometimes that's the biggest barrier. So I, that's where I kind of go usually when, when I hear people express some hesitancy is trying to find out the why and then trying to address that specifically. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cuvette. Can I chime in here? Um, uh, I totally agree with Livia and I think um, one of the, the big things I've tried to do is you know, sort of just make myself available for questions from anyone and you know, I'll have a colleague who says, oh, can you talk to my nephew about you know, questions they have? But ultimately, you know, we, we should be available for the information, but what I think we really need are like thousands of Tiffany's, right? We need people like Tiffany who are making appointments, not pushing anything on anyone, but sh she changed someone's mind just by, by encouraging others. And I think that if, if we have a lot of people who hear this message and then go on and become Tiffany, we're gonna, I think we can address maybe the, the root of that problem because, because you can build that trust. Um, Absolutely. He's trusting the message that, you know, the, the science is giving and then, and they trust her. Dr. Ojeda, do you raise your hand? You're muted. Yes. Um, yeah. So I, I wanted to echo on what both Valerie and Livia said. I think, and and what Seth said also, acknowledging that there is mistrust is really important, and it's and at least when I have these conversations, I I I I say, I'm not here to force anything. I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to have a conversation, and acknowledging that it might take days, weeks, or even longer. And that's and, and that's okay because um, people have their own journey and their own time when they're gonna feel comfortable accepting a decision, whether it's a vaccine, wh wh whether it's treatment for other other medical problems. It it takes every person is different. It, no one reads the book, and and I think uh, one important thing also is that all all of these efforts that we're doing. To, to, to get people vaccinated should not stop at the vaccine. It should also en encompass the entire system to make feel people to make people feel comfortable coming into the hospital for their preventive care, for treatment of STIs, for transgender health. I think it, it just cannot stop here with the vaccine. It needs to go forward on that. Great. Um, so I do I do want to I know that uh, I want to hear from um, Ozzy and Dr. Verna on this, uh, and I know that uh, Dr. Verna has been on, you know, both sides of this with family member and also being a, as a as a physician here on the front line. So, Medina, I'll start with you, and then we will uh, we'll end this question with uh, with Ozzy. Okay, so my personal experience with talking with family members about the vaccine, you know. I have people that I talk to in the community. I talk to people even at work about their perception about the vaccine, sometimes hesitancy. But I think the major point of what a lot of people want to know, and I had this brought to my attention by one of my patients who was, um, I would say, 60 something African American woman. And she was asking me about, you know, whether or not she should get the vaccine. And her main question was, well, do you have it? And when I was able to show her that I had it and show proof, she was more excited and more engaged about learning about the vaccine from me. And, you know, I just told her the conversation is something to get her mind moving about getting the vaccine. She can always follow up, make further decisions from there. But giving people the open space to feel vulnerable with you is also another thing that's important sometimes. As medical professions, medical professionals, we use words and jargon that may make people feel a little bit less than, especially when talking about something that's already a controversial um, subject. So I think just being vulnerable with them is another way of enforcing and highlighting the need for vaccine. Yeah, I think that, you know, Joe Ash and I, and I'm going to get to you, Ozzy. Joe Ash and I have had several conversations about speaking in what I love his term, the family tongue, when you're talking to people about this, right? So like you talk, you should talk to people 
uh, who have questions, like you're speaking to your, your grandma or your aunt or your mom or your sister or your brother, um, even as medical professionals, to, 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 to sort of shed that, to be able to, um, to, to really distill it down to what people really need and want to know in a way that they can understand and, uh, and hear it. Um, you know, so, Ozzy, I'm, I'm actually really curious, Ozzy and Joe Ash as, as community advocates, I'm really curious as to what you what you guys are hearing as uh, as far as barriers and concerns that people are having. You know, from where we see it on the on the hospital side, on the inpatient side, and maybe to some extent with our families. But I know that you guys reach further into the the communities uh, and have deep roots here. So really interested in and what you're hearing from people around around um, hesitancy, around access issues. And any thoughts on how um, Vasco Brothers Medical Center or New Vance Health can help with those issues? So we'll start with you, Ozzy. Um, well, some of the people that I have actually talked to, it's not that they are hesi hesitating about getting the vaccine, it's just that it has not been available to them. So I personally share with folks the link that I got from CVS and Walgreen in order for them to make an appointment with um, those pharmacies. So I think the more we are able to get people um, ha so that they can have access, they are certainly willing, especially people in my um, age group, I'm talking 50 and over. So Joash may deal with a younger group, but I also think it's important for us, at, at least when I try to share information, I just want people to know that if they have chronic health issues like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, they may have a more positive outcome for as far as protection if they develop COVID, uh, uh, COVID-19. So they may be in a, a safety zone and they may not be as sick as some of the people that we actually knew in the community because I would say, well, you know, this one, this one, this one, because of their diabetes, because of their asthma, um, they did not survive. So certainly, Maybe if those folks had been able to get the vaccine before they got sick with the uh, COVID, then they would have had a more positive outcome. So I think it's up to us to let people know that uh, there are underlying risk factors. For me, I, I like to speak, I don't, and let me just say, I always try to tell people, my job is to provide information and it's up to you how you use it. And that's what you're saying. You want people to have information. You're not trying to convince them so that they make their own decisions. So that's what I try to share with people as well, because they may not know that they are at risk because of the diabetes, that their outcome may not be more positive if they have the diabetes and the high blood pressure. So um, access is very important. So I think that's one thing that people are concerned about, getting access to that. So Ozzy, I'm going to ask you if, uh, if you have that link available, if you could post it in the chat for, for everyone to see. That would be great. If not, then um, we can uh, we can get it later and uh, email it out uh, to, to the people. Sure, I'll see and because uh, send it to me via the phone because that's why I pick up medication. So a lot of people will get it that way. I'll see if I can find that for you. I appreciate it, Joe Ash. Any thoughts? I think. Thank you so much for that. And Ozzy, I, I, I share a lot of what, you, what you're seeing. I, what I'm seeing on the ground here begs the question, Dr. Ayers, that we spoke about before. Is this hesitancy or is this fear? I think sometimes we see someone on the street that we might not know and they look mean or angry and they might just be hungry or they might just be grieving for something we don't know. So being able to pattern recognize, I think a great example, I, around New Year's, was speaking to a frontline worker, works in uh, one of the senior care buildings we have in the city of Poughkeepsie, and articles coming out about side effects of the vaccine were almost confirming the sense that it hasn't been verified. And that's because people didn't know what to expect that any symptoms you get after the vaccine are actually your immunoresponse working. 
and literally not being able to connect the dots because there was no one in our way, as some of the other panelists have discussed. We need a thousand people to just be available, to just know how to communicate with someone and how to let them know, walk through the questions they have. Because it got to the point of, you know, this, this, this woman who was expressing hesitancy is a mother and doesn't want to get a vaccine that based on an article she read online, she could die four years later. So she's treating this as something that's life or death when in fact we've had fevers before and we know what side effects for vaccines are. But with so much information here at us, our hesitancy is just hedging against worst case scenario. So if we're able to meet someone in the, in the seat of fear and help guide them through the action that they can take. One thing you told me that I didn't know is, you know, someone saying, well, someone got the vaccine and they still got the virus. One thing you said to me, Dr. Ayers, is, but having gotten the vaccine, the virus can't rip through the body or the internal organs and cause the type of long-term damage that it would if you didn't get the vaccine. That makes concrete sense. And I think these are the things that from the public sector, we're looking for, we're looking for as a community to make sense of all of the information that's coming our way. And young and old, I find this as a unifying theme between, between all of the doubt that people have brought to the vaccine. Right, and speaking of, of what to expect, right? So that's a nice segue, and I wanna turn it over to Drs. Cousette and Ojeda um, with regards to what are the vaccines that are available, just to make sure that we're uh, operating on, on the same uh, platform here with, with our knowledge base. What are, the, what are the vaccines that are available? What are the differences between them? And, and speak to some of those side effects and why, why those side effects um, mean that your body is reacting the way that it should. So we'll start with you, Dr. Suzette. So um, as most may know, we have three vaccines that have been authorized for use, emergency use in the U.S. Um, two of them are what are called mRNA vaccines. Those are from Pfizer and Moderna. Um, they require two doses. It's the way they were studied. Um, and in the studies showed that they were 94 and 95 percent effective at preventing um, symptomatic illness, meaning, you know, having, having symptoms, even if it was just like a runny nose or something. Um, and then the other one is the Johnson & Johnson or the uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals vaccine, which is a one-dose vaccine. Um, and overall, uh, its effectiveness was in the, in the high 60s at preventing mild illness. So some people will say, oh man, those first two sound way better than the second one. Um, but it turns out that from all three of the vaccines, when you look at the outcome of severe illness, meaning landing in the hospital or death, all of them were 100% effective at that in the studies. So they all work. Um, and they all work remarkably well. Um, so, you know, there, uh, I think a lot of the information out there about, you know, you want this one, you don't want that one. I, I don't think for, for what we care about, which is people in the hospital and people dying, they're all pretty close to perfect. Um, not a lot of things in medicine are pretty close to perfect. So we, we got pretty lucky um, with this. Um, and you know, I think that one of the things that uh, Medina brought up is is the idea of you know, being vulnerable and expressing vulnerability. And and I think it is important to say when we're talking about the vaccines that, just like with everything with COVID, is all of this is new. We have a lot of history with the science of vaccines um, and how vaccines work and the development of drugs and vaccines. So we have trust in that science and in that process, which makes me and us sort of trust um, that these vaccines are, are safe and effective. Um, but we have to acknowledge that everything is new um, and, and there's always gonna be unknowns. And we've been dealing with unknowns since, um, you know, March of, March of 2020, where, where things have, have constantly changed. It's been the only constant, right, change. Um, so, so it, I'll, I'll sort of leave it there. Obviously, I can, uh, we can answer any specific questions, but I think that the most important piece is that um, we have fantastic vaccines that are very effective available to us and very safe. Um, I don't know if Hector wants to talk a, about some of the side effects and the responses. I'll leave, I'll leave something. Right, there. but yeah, and, and so, but if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, right, what you're saying is that, um, 
we don't have to we don't have to have everyone never get COVID to, to end this pandemic. What what we're interested in and the the outcomes that the studies looked at was whether or not people got so sick from COVID that they required oxygen or that they required hospitalization or that they died. Right? And in that regard, all three vaccines have been 100% effective in the study. Okay? So I just want to make sure that that, that we we, um, we get that point across. Um, and Dr. O'Hara can speak to, to side effects, um, you know, what to expect, you know, um, what should you expect, what what would make you seek out um, additional um, uh, um, advice from a, a healthcare professional if it were to happen. Um, I'd also, Hector, if you don't mind, could you mm -hmm. speak to um, so with side effects or how the how the vaccine affects your body. Also talk about how it doesn't affect your body. So there's a lot of talk out there about it changing your DNA, about fertility and things like that. So if you could address those two issues, um, it'd be great. So a um, few questions. So yeah, in terms of the DNA, um, if the vaccine does not affect your DNA whatsoever, uh, messenger, messenger RNA is sort of the way that I see it's like a snapshot. The the cells look at it. That's sorry, the the ribosomes, which is what makes the, the proteins and, and and the antibodies. Um, it looks at it, then it, it reads it, and then it makes the protein, and then the mRNA disappears. Um, the mRNA is out outside of the area where the DNA is, so they're not at any point in the same in the same area at at any point. So. Concerns of any uh, damage to the DNA should should um, that there are there are no concerns that it's going to affect your DNA. In terms of infertility, that that there are unfortunately certain conspiracy theories out there that the that the vaccine causes infertility. And I've had one conversation with someone who's trying to get pregnant that does not want to get the vaccine just just because of. Of, of, of what you read on, on, on the internet. Um, there, in the clinical trials for Moderna and Pfizer, there were some, some people that got pregnant after have re, have, having received the, the, the vaccine. Uh, so yeah, the, the, there's no, no proven data that there is, it causes any infertility. Um, in, I don't know if Valerie wants to add anything in terms of, 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 the, of those two things. But in terms of side effects, the most common ones are uh, pain at the at the side of, of, of where they gave you the, the vaccine. Me personally, when I when I had both doses uh, of Pfizer, I did feel uh, pain for two days. Um, fever is uh, is uh, relatively common. It should not be a high fever. So if you get anything above uh, one or two, I would I would speak to your doctor. That would be unusual with with uh, with the vaccine, you might feel achy, you might feel tired, you might feel r r run down. And in, in my personal uh, uh, experience with the first dose, I only uh, uh, felt tired for maybe like 10 hours with the first dose. I ne never never got fevers with any of them, but with the second dose, I felt tired and achy for about 40, 48 hours, um, and then it just w w went away. Um, I was also working, so it's hard to know if I was tired from work, but uh, I, they, they both went away within 48 hours, both the achiness, the tiredness, and the, and the injection site pain. Okay. I'll add one thing, that I, one thing that I found um, interesting, I was reading today about um, who's more likely to get uh, these these uh, immune, you know, sort of stronger immune responses. And I think uh, actually Joash mentioned it. So really what you're getting is, I, I don't like to call it a side effect because it's not a side effect. It's it's what the vaccine should be doing, which is is making your immune, your immune system respond to the, to that little protein um, that the, that the vaccine uh, creates. And so, you know, so it's just, it's doing what it, what it should. We are just getting sort of a, a stronger um, reaction from it. 
So it, it shouldn't be something that people are afraid of as a side effect, it, it, it's what's expected. Uh, but what's interesting, it sounds like, is that um, so younger people, so those under 65 are more likely to get these reactions than those older, older than 65, and women more than men, um, interestingly, uh, are reporting uh, these symptoms um, more, so just in terms of expectations. You know, I, I'm curious uh, for uh, Dr. Santiago um, from the emergency room uh, perspective, um, are you seeing people that are having complications from the vaccine come in or are you hearing anything in, in the community, um, uh, primary care offices or anything about people having complications from the vaccine? No, and actually I, I, I did wanna make the point that you know, working in the emergency department, you get a little bit of a window and maybe sometimes an earlier window to what's what's coming. Um, and we, you know, we sort of experienced that with the surges that we had throughout the year um, of seeing those increasing numbers of COVID positive patients. And then um, with that, maybe a week later, you'd start to see the really sick COVID positive patients and, and hospitalizations would start climbing. Um, but I haven't seen an uptick in terms of um, vaccine related side effects. You know, it's mostly what we what has been described um, from just talking to colleagues and, and people who've had it here at work um, of the of the expected again, not really side effects, but the expected um, effect of the vaccine. Um, but it, I just wanted to bring it back to that point is again, having that window in the emergency department, I also see what the alternative is, right? So we can get vaccinated and have 100% protection from hospitalization um, and death, or we can not get vaccinated. And that alternative is scary because having worked through these last several months and seeing people, sometimes my age, sometimes younger, who can't breathe, who end up on a ventilator, who sometimes spend over a month or two in a hospital and then die on the other side of that. You know, when you are faced with that as the reality of the alternative that's out there to not getting vaccinated, I think it makes the choice a lot clearer. Um, and, you know, again, just having been on that front line and seeing that over and over and over again, you that I think that's why we were, you know, I, I never had a will. I never had a, I had never done a will for my family um, until uh, April of last year. And my husband and I went out and we wrote up a will because that's what we were seeing. Um, and that's what we were afraid of. So I think it's always important to sort of keep that in mind that there, the alternative to getting vaccinated and getting protected is, is can be really scary. Thank you. Hey, John, I don't know if we have any questions coming from outside that we haven't, uh, we have time for probably a, a question or two. Sure, we have a couple. Um, you know, one person has asked uh, anyone on the panel, um, how do we broach hesitancy in family and friends who may send us articles that, you know, may spread that misinformation that Seth was talking about, you know, you know, distrust of the vaccine. You know, how do you, how do you counter those? All right, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, Medina, I know that you've had conversations with people. Uh, talk, talk to us about how you approach that, you know, that, that, that hesitancy that based in, you know, maybe pseudoscience or not quite science or fiction even uh, from something that someone pulled off of the internet. Well, I think that in terms of people spreading misinformation, I actually saw um, a family friend who had some misinformation up on their Instagram account, and it was kind of disheartening, but it depends on, to be honest with you, if that person is in the space to receive your information, because a lot of times, once they've already believed some of that pseudoscience to be real, a lot of people have that way of thinking already from what I've personally experienced. But my solution to that would be to explain to them the science behind the vaccines as we've been discussing throughout the panel today and also kind of ask them and question them on where their sources are from. 
You know, a lot of times with a lot of the pseudoscience, when you ask people to back up their information, the conversation becomes shaky at best. So, you know, you kind of have to challenge where that information is from and also speak to them to what you know about the vaccine and what you've personally seen as well. Um, it's also a hard topic to be able to solve in one conversation as well. So people like that, I would just recommend that you continue to have respectful conversations because there's also a line where you have to, you know, remember that this is not anything for people to get upset about or get into arguments about because people are allowed to have their own set way of thinking. Um, we have to be respectful of that as well. But I think just having respectfully open conversations and sometimes you win people over and sometimes you don't, but you have to also be fine in the fact that you're not gonna always bring people to the side of feeling comfortable with the vaccine as well. Tiffany, you've also done some work in this. Do you, you have anything additional to, uh, to say? Um, I think for me, it was helpful to just share my experience. You know, with anybody who was curious about it, just, you know, I, I trusted the science. I trusted that the scientists that were working on this, these vaccines that have put their life's work into it, um, you know, they were producing something safe for us. Um, and I wanted to be an example to my community um, to show them that I felt that it was safe and I wasn't someone who was gonna let them down. Great. Can we do have one other, we do have one other question. Um, you know, one thing that we haven't talked about today is, you know, what can people do differently after they've been vaccinated? Is that an incentive to get vaccinated? You know, right so far, you know, people, you know, we tell people you still have to wear your mask, you still have to do all the, the things which are very important, but what can people do after they get vaccinated? So John, thank you. That that was actually the question I kind of wanted to end on with, with this group and just to ask in general, what are you looking forward to, right? Um, after you get the vaccine or if you already have it and once, once uh, enough of us have gotten vaccinated, what can we look forward to, you know, in our communities, at, at, in our families, as a country? Uh, we'll start with you, Ozzy. Um. <clears throat> Once we get the vaccine, I think we should look forward to sending our children back to school. Um, once again, that's very important to me. And also, um, I want to travel. I want to go to South Carolina to see my three grandsons. Um, they think I'm being distant, but I explained to them until Uma gets the vaccine, she cannot go anywhere. So I feel safer knowing that I can travel and I would stay within their household um but traveling um and a small gatherings with friends you don't want to retire and not be able to do anything so i'm going to look forward to my small gatherings with family friends and my co-workers i miss them and also just being back in the community to help in any way i can to push our agenda forward for a healthier community a safer community and uh, those are the things that I'm excited about. What about you, Joe Ash? You know, I have to be honest, I had my family with me for most of this pandemic and we get to spend some high quality time together. I'm excited to be able to enjoy the fresh air, the sunshine um, with the people I love and be able to see more of those folks more frequently. Absolutely. Beth? So my sister is uh, getting married, um, hopefully within the next year or two, um, to a very wonderful gentleman um, whose family is from Nigeria. And from what I understand, Nigerian weddings are ridiculously fabulous. And there's lots of <laughs> dancing and incredible food. And I am most definitely looking forward to experiencing um, the joy of a Nigerian wedding um, with my loved ones. Absolutely, Hector. So uh, for the first time since the pandemic, I actually uh, on uh, on Saturday had dinner with my neighbors. I I love my neighbors. I miss them, and we were just talking, but we had not had 
an Argentinian meal uh, in a year and they're amazing cooks. So I miss that. But um, I also miss traveling. I have a nephew that I haven't met who lives in Italy. So I am looking forward to visiting him and meeting him, hopefully in the near future. What about you, Valerie? Um, I too, I forget who said it early on, um, had been so anxious to get my parents vaccinated. Um, and as of next Friday, they will be two weeks past their second dose. And so the thing I've been, we're like counting down the days until they can see my, see my daughter whenever they want. Um, she really misses her abuela. So, um, so hopefully, um, so that, that'll be a big thing. Um, I'm gonna also echo, I think one of the things I was most excited about this week was hearing that the vaccine, that Moderna was starting vaccine studies in children. Um, and I think that'll be a game changer for the start of the school year um, and getting kids back to their, um, to their good uh, social setting and, and being able to, you know, interact with each other and, and have and part of their social development, which I think is, has been really lacking, unfortunately for them. Medina? So I would say for me, um, traveling is something that I dearly miss. And also, um, I have a 96-year-old aunt who just got vaccinated, so I'm excited to be able to see her so shortly. Great. Tiffany, I don't think I've asked you yet. Nope. Um, I am so happy to kiss and hug my parents and truly feel safe doing that since the first time since last April, um, to sort of echo Dr. Santiago's um, mention of the will last year, I had some conversations with my parents about what their end of life wishes would be if anything happened to them, if they had gotten COVID. And now that we're all vaccinated, I feel a great sense of relief and joy um, to not have to have those conversations right now. Um, and I am planning a summer vacation, so I'm happy about that too. Awesome. Olivia. Uh, yeah, I, I second um, the, uh, or third or fourth, the, uh, <laughs> the desire for travel. And, you know, through the, this past year, I lost my grandfather, not to COVID, but because of COVID, you know, we couldn't really um, have a gathering. So I think, you know, even just paying proper respect to those we've lost over the last year is gonna be important and doing that with family, being able to get together. Uh, my mom is now fully vaccinated as well. So that actually is helping me out because she was supposed to be one of my sources of support. And throughout this pandemic, I've had to keep her away from, from my house and my children. So um, I think a lot of, a lot of um, good lights at the end of that tunnel, so. So I, I, I will end it and, or actually, John, what are you looking forward to? Well, Brenda, I was going to ask the same for you, but, um, you know, I will say that I'm, uh, number one, just looking at all these smiles, uh, you know, you can tell everyone is looking forward to a lot of things. You know, I'm looking forward to doing more of these panels, but doing them in person and not over Zoom. I love the, the ability of Zoom to connect us all, but I also love the ability to bring people into a, you know, into a single place and and have a discussion or a conversation like this with our doctors, our friends, our neighbors. But, you know, afterward, you know, break into one-on-ones, you know, have those kind of connecting conversations. I miss that so much because that's kind of my job and my life. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, beyond what all of you said, um, that's something I'm very much looking forward to. So I'll turn it over to you, Brenda, to close. And please tell us what you're excited to do as well. Um. Like you, John, I am I am very much excited to continue the the work in person that we started. We had some really great initiatives. Um, a, a lot of those things I was working on with a lot of people on this panel right now um, that had to to be on hold for safety reasons because of COVID. Um, so looking forward to really getting back to to that good work around food insecurity and the opioid epidemic, which we you know don't even really talk about now, but it's only gotten worse because of because of the pandemic. Um, and, and the other thing I'm also looking forward to is uh, you know, family and just being, being with them. And uh, I did not realize how much I truly, truly, truly missed my family to not 
until I wasn't able to, to see them the way that uh, the way that I wanted to not be able to go home and have my grandma make a sweet potato pie for me and mm-hmm. do that safe. So I, I am really looking forward to my grandma's sweet potato pie. And, uh, you know, so I want to say thank you to everybody. Um, this is, this has been amazing. Um, the energy has been amazing. The commitment here, I can tell from each of you, um, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will be, uh, we will be building on this, on this energy. And, uh, you know, I think next step would be to continue with these community connections and figure out how Vassal Hospital, New Vance Health can help serve our community. You know, how, how we can reach out to the faith communities and, and offer support for pop-up clinics and things like that. So more to come on that. And, and, and I look forward to our next discussion. Thank Bye-bye. you.